Now we're going to talk about the MPT. Okay? So save that question. It may still be relevant by the time you know, we get to some place where it is. Okay. Why do we want to make a distinction between Adams for Peace and NPT? Adams for Peace, after all, says we should promote peaceful nuclear energy. So does the NPT. It says that they, things should be safeguarded. They're peaceful. Make sure they become military. Well, so does the NPT. Um, and actually, they both kind of say it would be nice if the world disarmed. Okay, so a lot of times you get people just talking about these two things as if they're two sides of the same coin. And in a sense, they are. However, I think what distinguishes these two initiatives is more interesting than what unifies them. In particular, they had very different views of the strategic threat that they, they were trying to mitigate. Again, with Adams for Peace, massive diversions for that knockout blow. In the case of the NPT, there were uh, two different uh, visions. One vision at the beginning, and we'll get into under the Irish resolutions, was a concern with catalytic war and uh, the problem that as you spread weapons, uh, you might lose control of them. Um, once negotiations bogged down in the early 60s, they tried to supercharge things by doing a study. It was called the Swedish Resolution Study, which came in 61, and the study results came, I believe, in 62. That had a different set of concerns, actually. It wasn't so much the horizontal spread and what it might lead to uh, or, 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 or prompt. It was the vertical proliferation upward, quantitatively and qualitatively, in the superpower. And the concern was that if you had enough hair trigger systems and you, and you had a big enough arsenal with colonels and majors holding the trigger, pretty soon something would go off and you'd regret the whole thing. Yeah? Those differences, on the one hand, explain the difference between Adams for Peace and the NPT with regard to what they they, how restrictive they were with regard to what they thought was permissible or safeguardable or peaceful. And it also explains something even more interesting. The, the, the kind of creative or, not, or dysfunctional tension within the MPT itself, it is kind of a treaty that's at war with itself in that it has two different concerns and two different sets of of articles. Roughly, the Irish Resolution generated the first three articles. Them that's got, don't give. Them that's not, don't get. And we want those that don't have to have all their civil nuclear activities um, inspected to safeguard against diversion to, to military purposes. The second set of Articles are Article 4, you know, unre re relatively unrestricted access to civil nuclear technology. Article 5, uh, the sharing of the potential benefits of peaceful nuclear explosives. Article 6, there should be good faith efforts by the superpowers to disarm. Uh, and Article 10, which gives you the right to leave uh, with 90 days notice if you have compelling reasons. Okay, those articles uh, are sort of the result of the Swedish resolution, and we'll get into that. To try to understand what's safeguardable and what's permissible, though, you have to pick one of the two competing visions with it, that the NPT had as, as what the concern was, horizontal or vertical. And if you, if you look at it, through the lens of the Swedish resolution, which was primarily concerned about vertical proliferation, you have a very lax view of, of what uh, is not to be tolerated. In other words, you, you, you're, you're more generous and, 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 and not so concerned about uh, various kinds of nuclear activities. Whereas if you have the Irish resolution mentality, you have a more conservative take on that. And I think the reason why it's worth going through all this, besides that we have a review conference coming up in 24 months, 
is every controversy that we have over Saudi Arabia, Iran, North Korea, Iraq, can't be understood unless you pick sides. Because whether we talk about the NPT or not, it's in the shadow intellectually as to how we look at daily news and different nuclear crises as to what we think we can export and safely share with whom or not. Okay? All right, that's the apologia. Why don't we get started? Well, I just explained number one. We don't have to go through that. Uh, what are the premises of the first three articles? We'll get to that. And uh, the articles after the first three, what were their premises, and how are these articles at war with one another? OK, first, uh, a little bit of drum roll here. Um, 58 through 61 is basically the Irish uh, uh, Frank Aiken, uh, foreign minister who submitted in 58, 59 the Irish resolutions through to this breakpoint that I have created historically, which is the Swedish resolutions, which were done in 61. Um, the lead up to these Irish resolutions of are kind of interesting. First, um, we were sharing nuclear weapons in NATO. And we had some, the notion was that, well, we would have control over these weapons and release them from the command center. And then the, the weapons could be used uh, by local commanders, including non-Americans like Germans. Now remember, the, the, the Second World War, was still within memory. I mean, it wasn't that long ago. And if you were Russian, you know, it, your memories were even more vivid than if you were American, for obvious reasons. Yeah. They invaded you, and they did really nasty things. So the idea that um, they, there should be any nuclear weapons at all on German soil is hard. But what happened is um, Congress did an investigation in 58 see how well these things were being controlled. This was a plane that actually was found on the tarmac, uh, basically almost with the engines running, with a weapon strapped to it, and an American sentry with a, I don't know, an M1 gun. That was it. Uh, I think there was a claim that at the time there was a German, you know, possibly sitting in the plane. Um, that didn't quite accord with what people thought was going on. And the fear was, well, you know, that might go off. Also, it's worth noting these planes, the F, uh, I think it's 104, they tended to crash a lot. Wouldn't want them to crash with a nuclear warhead on it. There were uh, four crashes of our main intermediate bomber in the 50s as well. Uh, some of these are harrowing, broken arrow things. But also, we, we were deploying the Davy Crockett at the time. This is one-tenth of a, of a kiloton. Uh, you'll notice there's one guy there. Uh, and well, you could, you know, you better hope he isn't bored. You know, if he gets bored, it could be a really exciting afternoon. These things were going on. And then most important, the Suez Crisis. I don't know how many people know what the Suez Crisis and war was about, but essentially, uh, Israel, uh, Great Britain and France conspired to, to uh, orchestrate a war, uh, if you will, to get control of the Suez away from the nationalization efforts of uh, Mr. Nasser. And um, it didn't go well. And at one point or another, uh, there were threats of nuclear war being bandied about between the Soviets and the Americans to get the fighting to, to cease. Uh, that was upsetting. And Essentially, then you have this, this problem. Now, this is admittedly by the mid-60s, but it's still during the time this thing was being negotiated. You had 10,000 nuclear weapons in the American arsenal floating around or stationed overseas. It's a lot of stuff to keep track of. Uh, Cuba, oh, well, the, the Soviets put 158 nuclear weapons in Cuba. Now, th that upset us, by the way. We were upset, you see. Well, you can imagine how upset other people might have been you know, who didn't have nuclear weapons. Poland, Hungary, 
I don't know what the numbers were. I, I just put hundreds. I don't really know. So people are watching all this. And studies, uh, this is what happens. You have these non-governmental organizations. And they start writing about things. The National Academy, I think, of Sciences did a study. And this was then published by the Planning Association, National Planning Association. World Without Arms Control. I recommend it. It has every arms control idea you've ever heard of it's a, in this one single pamphlet. It's really quite a powerful document. A set of arguments were used by this fellow, who was Irish, straight out of the report. And the report said, among other things, that um, we can't ever get disarmament if we don't at least stop the further proliferation of these weapons. Because there'll be so many people sitting around the table, no one will ever agree about anything. That was point one. That Maybe it's time to put a pause on proliferation if you ever want to hope to get disarmament. By the way, in the 50s, disarmament wasn't going very well. So this was a way of beginning to do something that was purposeful while you couldn't do what you really wanted to do, yeah. if you were Irish, for example. Yeah. All right, so you have that. I think, um, hang on here. The other argument he made, um, oh, one other thing that was kind of sporty that people are aware of. From 1953 to 1958, uh, nuclear weapons were threatened to be used about eight times, made the press. And people, it was kind of in the air. It was a diff different time. We, we worry about things today. They had a lot to worry about then, too, maybe even more than we do. Um, he made another set of arguments. He says, you know, proliferation is like if a neighbor gets a nuclear weapon, it's kind of like your neighbor who gets a gun saying hello by shoving the gun through your window with his finger on the trigger saying, hi. It could change the way you, you know, behave. You might get nervous, stressed out. You might get a gun. You might shove it through his window. Ooh. That sounds provocative. Could lead to a war. So he's worried about that. In addition, he had a number of really interesting arguments. By the way, they all came from that report. No originality here. Um, oh. Let's see. Oh, well, he thought that his allies felt nervous about someone getting a weapon, that they would ask, countries that had weapons that they were allied to to help station weapons on their soil. And that if this, this chain, the whole, all God's children were going to have nuclear weapons on their soil. Then he said something about civil nuclear technology. He said, in addition, reactors are spreading. And instead of them being used for peaceful purposes, people will be very tempted to use them to make plutonium, to make bombs. Finally, and it was in this uh, report, uh, A World Without Arms Control. As these weapons spread, the fear was there might be accidental and unauthorized use or irresponsible mischief making. I like that idea, mischief making. Nuclear mischief making. One small nation could catalyze, that's the key word, a nuclear conflict between larger powers or might cause pre-existing non-nuclear hostilities to escalate into nuclear hostilities. Think of the Suez crisis if Israel had a bomb. Ooh. By the way, one of the key reasons that war was fought was a promise to give Israel nuclear weapons because they didn't want to do it unless they got something. They were asked to kind of be the fall guy for starting the war. And they said, well, we'll do it. But France, Great Britain, you have to help us get a nuclear weapon. And they agreed to do that. So this wasn't too far off the mark. You see what I'm saying? I mean, it's sort of sometimes academic studies by non-governmental organizations are worth reading. I mean, they might not be 100%, but they might be worth reading or even citing or even acting on. By the way, this is my story. I, 
I raise money that way. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, one of the things he said is that was also interesting is that um, nuclear disarmament uh, would be hurt if you didn't non-proliferate, but the world without arms control also made a bunch of arguments about how urgent it was to stop the madman momentum of the arms race, that vertical proliferation would be a problem too. Frank Aiken cut that out. He did not go down that route. It's very interesting. He said, well, actually, the superpowers have sort of learned how to work with one another and deter one another. It wasn't really clearly true, but he said it. And he said, we need to do the non-proliferation bit first, then we can do the disarmament. We shouldn't demand disarmament first as a precondition to do non-proliferation. This is interesting because today it's just the opposite with a lot of folks. Not so in the, the original game. Um, he also said, of course it would be unfair and discriminatory for countries that have power reactors to have to undergo intrusive inspections when other countries already had nuclear weapons and they, they wouldn't be inspected. But here's the good news. You're a guinea pig for peace. You'll be the example that'll show us how to do intrusive inspections to do the disarmament against the countries that have nuclear weapons. So you're giving it the office. It, 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 you'll feel good, and in the end, it'll work out. You'll get to where you want to go. All right. So um, that was roughly Article 1, Article 2, and Article 3. And I've already said what they, them that's got don't give at least control <laughs> over the weapons because we were deploying them, and so were the Russians. And the argument was, oh, but if we have control over them, it's OK to base them overseas. But you can't give control directly or indirectly. You can't help people manufacture them directly or indirectly. And, and vice versa, you're not to accept weapons un, uh, under your control. And you're not to directly or indirectly you know, get into the game of manufacturing. All right? And we're going to safeguard countries that aren't nuclear to make sure they don't go in that direction with their civil activities or materials. First three articles, all right? What happened after that? Well, not a whole lot. At first, the Americans actually resisted the first resolution. It wasn't until the second resolution. Then things stalled from 59, basically, through 61, and people were getting antsy. The Swedes, who were trying to get a nuclear weapon at the time, it's funny how that works, um, said, well, we got to do something. Why don't we uh, make an inquiry into the conditions under which countries not possessing nuclear weapons might be willing to enter into undertakings to refrain from manufacturing or otherwise acquiring weapons and to refuse to receive in the future nuclear weapons in their territories. Now, this sounds innocuous and harmless. The United States went nuts. It didn't like it. Why? Because it made it sound as though countries shouldn't in Western Europe or Taiwan or Japan ever accept these things, even if they didn't have control over them which was precisely the game plan under the massive retaliation theory, or I shouldn't say theory, um, policy of the Eisenhower administration. The Russians immediately liked this. That's not what's interesting about this, though, to me. What's interesting about this to us is it now makes it sound as though the smaller countries are giving something up. Under Frank Aiken, he said, you know, the smaller countries are the ones that want the non-proliferation obligations to be uh, imposed upon the superpowers. Now, we, we, we constantly today think, oh, no, no, uh, the superpowers want to put the heel of non-proliferation on smaller countries. Right? That's the way we look at it. And, and, and they say, and we should be compensated for that. Well, that came from the Swedish resolution, not from the Irish resolutions. The Irish resolution said, no, if you don't have weapons, you want no one to get them to make sure you don't have to get them and you won't be insecure. 
it was the superpowers that wanted to share them, after all, and they were the problem. Not the way we look at it now, we look at it the way the Swedes look at it in 1961. Now, why was there this flip? It's quite interesting. One of the reasons, well, let me see here. Oh, problem with the lecture. Got to follow the outline. Um, what's safeguardable under the Irish resolution? Small research reactors. He made it very clear that large reactors and nuclear fuel making were dangerous. That's the reason you needed to have inspections that were intrusive for countries that didn't have weapons that had these things. OK. Um, and safeguarding, as I mentioned, be a, a, a test bed for disarmament of the superpowers later. OK? All right, so this is Austin Unden. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. But uh, this is the, the break point that produces more than one through three. It produces four through 10, the articles. And as I say, one of the reasons for the flip, which I, I think was of some interest, was we were trying to figure out some reason to continue to test when, in 58, we began to agree to more test moratoriums for the Soviets. The lab said, well, wait a minute. <laughs> we got to keep testing. You know? So they came up with something called plowshares. Well, there must be something useful to do with these things. Let's see if we can create harbors or help do mining or you know, you know, build. What's that? Fracking. Fracking. Thankfully, we figured out how to do that without doing this. Mm -hmm. By the way, we, what they discovered is that everything that they did ended up being so radiologically dirty that cleaning up the radiological mess made the whole thing cost ineffective. There's a reason why no one has ever asked for assistance in doing a peaceful nuclear explosive. They, they've done the math. And that the countries that do them actually are testing nuclear weapons. That would be India, the peaceful nuclear explosive, and Russia. OK, but anyway, we were into this. And people thought, hey, man, that's it. That's, that's, we want some of that. And then there was, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, where? Uh, what, what happened to the, uh, what happened to the slide with the, uh, the killer apps? Is it there? Ah, we got to put that slide in. At the time, I think that was in the previous lecture. Previous lecture? I think it belongs here, too. It's hard, it's hard getting a good lecture. He, he forgets which lecture he's in. But uh, that slide, remember, we had nuclear automo automotives and nuclear locomotives and nuclear planes. And then uh, that also was going on at this time. So people thought that, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, what is it that every country needs to be cutting edge today economically? I don't know. Any, I, by the way, you can make it up. What is it? Computers, quantum, quantum bioengineering, uh, right. Well, this was like that. You know, if you had it, you were, you were, you're going you're gonna to be fine. Hypersonics. Hypersonics, well, you're getting a little exotic, but OK. I, I, I go with bioengineering first, but OK. Now, that was one thing. Um, the other thing that, that prompted the flip was the arms control so, uh, uh, planning, the, the world without arms control, concern about vertical proliferation, by 1961 was a big deal. I mean, we had all these systems being created. Uh, everything was on hair trigger. The numbers were going through the roof. I think by then we had 20,000 weapons. Uh, uh, Soviets had maybe, I don't know, 1,500, 2,000. So people are thinking, well, hey, one of these things might go off. Here you can see the numbers. It's kind of interesting. 61, yeah, USSR, yeah, I don't know, about 1 to 2,000. And then we're up around 20,000. You see the trajectories. So people thought the man man momentum of the arms race, just, yeah, by the way, you have to say that phrase over and over again, uh, has a certain musical ring to it. Um, <laughs> They kept saying that, and they kept looking at the evidence, and the evidence kept saying, there is one. Okay. Then there was uh, a concern. Let's, let's leave that out of it. Let's, go, let's move to this. There also was a new theory. Remember we had this 
discussion when we talk about deterrence. The French and our submariners, for different reasons, said a few weapons laid on a city in accurate would, would really be a good thing, and that's all you needed to provide for peace. Well, that was going on in the background. As a result, when they asked what the conditions would be, the answers that they got from the members of the UN were, hey, we want to get access to all the nuclear goodies we'd have if we had a bomb. That would be the peaceful nuclear explosives, some of those uh, nuclear lo locomotives and the uh, nuclear cars and uh, um, the nuclear airplanes and submarines. Whatever. All of that should be something that the superpowers are obligated to, to freely share information on least and, and help us get. Also, because total disarmament is ideal, but having a few would keep the peace as long as we reduced this nonsense, let's at least demand that there be arms control moving towards disarmament on the superpowers so that we don't fall victim to a hair trigger accident or attack due to all these systems that are ready to f fire in a few minutes. So finite deterrence, a, a belief in the, the value of, of nuclear civil um, activities and materials being at the cutting edge of economics, uh, a worry about the madman momentum of the arms race, actually were the three things that folks talk the most about. And one of the things the Italians, who also were working on the bomb, came up with is we should have the right to leave the treaty if we don't take care of these things. And in particular, if the mad, moment, mad bad momentum of the arms race isn't slowed, we can, we can choose to leave. Or if a neighbor gets one of these, we can leave. And we can do it in 90 days. Now, that's Article 10. The Article 4 which gives you an inalienable right. By the way, what else is an inalienable right? Where does that come from? Anybody know? Declaration of Independence. Well, at least they had good taste in using and ripping that off. The inalienable right to develop, produce, and research peaceful nuclear energy. That's Article 4. We talked about Article 10. And then Article 6 is. Um, you have to do good faith efforts towards total disarmament, nuclear disarmament, and arms control. And then um, Article 5 is we should have access to the potential benefits of peaceful nuclear explosives. And you'll come and do the explosion on our territory if you've got the explosive, but we will not develop them. OK, so now you now have most of the treaty. But what you don't have is a treaty that makes coherent sense. And the reason why, by the way, it, this held things up. Uh, we had this idea that we were going to uh, have, have ships, submarines, or in this case, uh, I guess these are cruisers, where there would be nuclear weapons and you'd have a mixed crew. And that was going to keep Italy, Germany, and everyone else from getting nuclear weapons. It was a goofy idea for a lot of reasons. And finally, it, we gave up on it in 64. That's when the treaty finally, the negotiations really got started. Because once we gave up on this idea, the Soviets were able to say, OK, fine. Let's work on this. OK, well, now, if you think the problem, the prime problem is the vertical proliferation of nuclear weapons ever going upwards, and that they're going on hair trigger, and that some accident or illicit use might occur because the superpowers have too many things to, and they can't manage them. And that what you need to do is bring that down, at, at least to finite deterrent force <laughs> levels. Um, and you think that's the primary threat. Then you're not so much, and if you think the threat of getting nuclear weapons is the way to force the superpowers into agreeing to do that, which is sort of what this is about. The, the uh, Swedish resolutions. 
says, we won't get them if you come down, if you give us access to civil benefits of nuclear energy. You know, there's, it's, it's this hostage thing. If you believe that, then the, the primary concern isn't about countries getting nuclear weapons. In fact, getting or being on the edge of getting nuclear weapons is what will take care of the primary problem, which is the vertical proliferation. Is that clear? Do you understand? OK, so um, what's safeguardable in the second cut is whatever is not non-explosive and declared has a conceivable civilian application and is inspected internationally. It is a much lower standard than the Irish Resolution set of concerns, where they said, well, of course, any reactor can be used to make bombs, and we have to worry about fuel making, and we need super intrusive inspections for that reason. That isn't the way the second cut looked at it. And in fact, you have, here's just an example. The Dutch delegate explained, uh, you can't deny any knowledge, materials, or equipment to a non-nuclear state until it's clearly established that that assistance will be used in the manufacture of nuclear weapons. There should be a clear presumption, all things being equal, that the assistance rendered will not be used. Why? Well, they pledged not to get a bomb. They had already given up their other inalienable right to self-defense to get bombs, which would normally make sense and would make sense if the superpowers don't come down or if these weapons spread to a neighbor. And in fact, we have Article 10 if we want to get nuclear weapons, because we might have to. A slightly different view than the Irish Resolution. Now, there were some concerns voiced about nuclear fuel making. Uh, here are two folks. I do love hats. Why don't we have hats anymore? <laughs> oh, well, my father wore a hat. Um, what's dangerous? Well, Mr. Wright, that's this fellow here, Sir Michael, the thing which is unique to a nuclear weapon is its warhead. And what's there in a nuclear warhead that's found in no other weapons? It's the fizzle, stupid. <laughs> right? That is to say the plutonium and uranium. And then he, he made it clear that that was a problem, that we had to do something about controlling the, the generation and production, stockpiling of that anywhere. In fact, the Swedish delegate uh, made it very clear. To block the road to nuclear weapons development early and possible, we are facing a long ladder of many rungs. It is reasonable and feasible to introduce the international blocking. Where do we begin? To prohibit just the final act of manufacturing seemed to come too late. And everyone agreed, yes, what, a, what, a, what an important point you're making. <laughs> oh, we'll get to that later. Guess what didn't happen? They never got to the point. Now, if you think it's just sort of the Eurocentric, white, dominant culture leaning on the burdened, developing world, it's fun to see that even the Burmese delegate was saying this. Uh, the undertaking on the part of the non-nuclear weapons power not to manufacture nuclear weapons would, in effect, mean foregoing the production of fissional material. They got it. They didn't. Do it. I showed you this facility uh, just to give you some idea. Uh, this is not theory. The, this, the safeguards don't tend to work on these large reprocessing plants. And here are some muff figures, 29 kilograms of material unaccounted for in 2005, 190 kilograms uh, leaked undetected for eight months in Kojima. Um, I mean, at Tokimura, you know, they couldn't find still 69 kilograms after, I don't know, $100 million clean out. They understood that there were, once you got into this, there'd be a problem. Um, there were even a, a nice State Department 1968 memo, state policy planning say, well, of course, the treaty allows everyone to do all of this, and, and presumably you could separate plutonium and get right to the edge of bomb making at any time. That's a problem. They didn't think about enrichment so much, because they figured no one could figure that out. Well, now we know they can figure that out. OK, uh, okay so when this treaty was finally finalized, you had two treaties welded together. One with a worry about the spread of nuclear weapons horizontally, one worried about the spread of 
nuclear weapons vertically, one with a very tight view of what was dangerous, another with a view that, no, the problem was disarming or reducing the rate of the arms race and the, and the superpowers, and that the threat of going nuclear actually was helpful. Of course, they didn't quite ever say that, but that's what that was about. And they were all together. Now, to understand what is peaceful, which becomes a big issue, let's say, when you're trying to adjudicate what should we allow Iran to have? What should we allow Saudi Arabia to have? What should we allow North Korea to have? India, I mean, we just keep going. Japan. You have to either pick one view or the other to understand what is peaceful. It's not defined. If you have the Irish view perspective, then what you do is you interpret what's peaceful to be what's safeguardable. And that is, that is uh, something that can be inspected in such a way that you can know and prevent the diversion. That is different than if you have a view that is the Swedish resolution view. If you have that view, it's whatever you declare. It's whatever's inspected internationally, whatever has a conceivable civilian application. Not only that, but the way you look at Article 6, 5, and 10 change if you have the Frank Aiken outlook. You then say, for example, as actually the UN did in 2010, that when you want to understand what the meaning of Article 5 is, go see Resolution XYZ on the need to ban nuclear testing, which is another way of saying Article 5, if you understand Frank Aiken's view, is now dead letter because it's too risky. It is too close to bomb making to test a nuclear explosive for civil purposes. It doesn't have any benefit anyway. It's dead letter. But if you look at Article 5 from the perspective of the Swedish resolutions, well, that may change. We should still have the right to that. Similarly, the right to leave the treaty tends to be viewed much more restrictively. I wanted to go through this. We still have both seven minutes. Uh, how many of you remember or even know what the phrase the agreed framework is? One hand, two hands, three hands. Eh, that's not bad. Okay. We agreed in exchange for suspending inspections, routine inspections, uh, but the, the, the North Koreans pledging not to proceed any further with their nuclear weapons program, uh, that we'd also help build two large light water reactors that were peaceful. By the way, this is the technology that resulted in them now having an experimental light water reactor that's producing probably tritium for their bombs. All right. Not so peaceful. Anyway, what's instructive is that in 93, Kim Il-sung announced that he wanted to withdraw. This was right before the agreed framework. And then we had the agreed framework to, to preserve this. By the way, one of the reasons we were desperate to get the agreed framework in 1994 was what happened in 1995. Does anybody know what happened in 1995? Happens every five years. It's the review of the NPT. Yes. This is, we have a ringer here. This is very good. What he said is, if you take a look at the treaty, it said 25 years after this thing comes into force, you should make a decision on whether to make its obligations uh, in perpetuity. And boy, this event seemed to be destabilize the possibility of getting into perpetuity. So we had to, quote unquote, get this off the front page. It's part of the reason why the agreed framework was so important to the Clinton administration and others. In any case, in 994, we said, hey, don't go down this route. Don't get the bomb. Let us get to this permanent extension, and we'll build these reactors for you. Then in 2003, after we discovered that they were cheating on the, uh, the agreed framework because they were enriching uranium, um, they pulled out. But you know what's interesting? They had run the first 89 days in 1993, such that this pullout took 24 hours. Kaboom, no pun intended. Wow. 
Well, yes, they had a test about three years later. And, oh, um, there's our reactor, uh, but it's a lot smaller. They did finally build it. It's a small one. I think that one's 100 megawatts thermal. I'm not sure. Someone can correct me on that. All right. First is 100, 1,000 uh, megawatts, order of magnitude smaller. But it's still pretty big, and it's still doing, it can do a lot of duty in producing weapons materials. Is that how the 10th article should work? By the way, the answer is, of course, no. That's the way it works. Unless you start reading this treaty as something that should have anyone who gets the civil benefits shouldn't ever be able to just say, oh, well, I've changed my mind. I'm going to you know, now just use this stuff to make bombs. If you don't, the treaty read in the open-ended way doesn't become a non-proliferation treaty. It becomes an engine to produce the conditions for proliferation. So it matters a lot as to which view you have. You can tell what my prejudice is. I like Frank Aiken. By the way, I always get invited to the St. Patrick's Day gathering at the embassy because I explained this to them. I said, you're Irish. You should be upset about the India deal. And they said, why? I said, well, let me explain who Frank Aiken is. They said, well, we know who he is. I said, yeah, but you don't know what he did. After I explained it, they actually opposed the India deal. All right. OK, last bit. This is the best part. Up until recently, we'll get into that moment, the way in which we talked about understanding the MPT is the three pillars view. I even heard a senator, I guess he was a Democrat, say, well, what about the three pillars? And he said this, I don't know, about a month ago. And I felt like whispering in his ear, hey, that's old school. You, know? you haven't caught on to how things changed. But this was the dominant view, that you needed to have nonproliferation uh, obligations agreed to, disarmament progressing, and the sharing of peaceful nuclear energy, and that each one of these pillars was equally important to the future of the NPT. That if any one of these things didn't progress, then well, the deal was off. It's a little weird. I mean, it's called the non-proliferation treaty. So you're saying if we don't share dangerous nuclear technology with you uh, that might lead to you making a bomb that uh, you have the right to leave? Or that if we don't disarm, then two wrongs make a right? Or I mean, I don't exactly know how this works. But that was the argument. It came from this Italian. It was not actually in the treaty negotiations that this was developed. A lot of people make it sound like it was. It was the Italians. Uh, here we are, rested on three pillars. And I think during the Obama administration, it reached a fever pitch. I mean, they actually argued that every one of these things was absolutely critical and that you couldn't, couldn't take anything out. And it's great if you're, if you're in an international forum to say this because, well, Everyone feels pretty good you know, about that. Now, this is where we are now. I, I actually gave a brief on this, a much more detailed one. If you take a look at uh, underestimated, there's a little riff about how nasty I think this three pillars idea is. Well, I gave a brief where I laid that out. And it made its way to Lawrence Livermore with someone who was advising whoever it is that was supposed to represent us at the prep con for the NPT review conference. Guess what he didn't talk about? The three pillars. Uh, what I argue is, no, there's one pillar, the non-proliferation pillar, and there are two struts, I call them, you know, little prompts. I mean, it isn't low, the disarmament point and the sharing of peaceful nuclear energy is not important. It is. But I think they have to be subordinate. This is the sort of the Frank Aiken way of seeing things. Right now, officially, I think that's how our government will behave and speaks about this. So I've been given this lecture, I think, for about 15 years. And I, I, every time people say, why do you bother? It's so obvious you're losing on this. The fight's, not over. fight's never over till it's over. 
Next week, what are we talking about? Help me. Where's, where's, where's my better halves? Those two back there. <laughs> what, what am I doing? What am I doing next week? Next week is arms control. Arms control. Yes. Oh, you'll enjoy that. Thank you.